In this video, I'm going to go over the features of Azure Databricks. Databricks is a managed service in Azure that's deployable through the Azure Marketplace and allows you to run applications in a serverless Spark-based workspace. This is very useful for data pipelines and big data analytics. You can manage a Databricks workspace via a UI that's accessible in Azure. Additionally, if you want to automate Databricks management, you can do so via the Databricks REST APIs. Databricks allows you to write notebooks, which run on Spark clusters, which you configure. It supports such common languages as Scala, Python, R, and SQL. Databricks is designed to integrate with many common Azure services used in big data storage and analytics, such as Synapse Analytics and Azure Blob Storage. For reporting and dashboards, it also integrates with Microsoft Power BI. Databricks is designed to use the role-based security compatible with Azure Active Directory, just like other first-party services in Azure. This means that it can be integrated from an authentication and authorization standpoint in the same manner as other services in your Azure ecosystem. In other words, users won't have to learn new credentials in order to log into the Databricks workspace. They'll use the same user credentials they use for other Azure services as part of a single sign-on experience. There are two environments in Azure Databricks. So far, I've mentioned the Databricks workspace. The workspace allows you to create notebooks for collaboration with other data professionals. It also allows you to configure Spark clusters to run automated jobs. This empowers you to create data pipelines that ingest incoming data, transform the data, and load it into a destination data lake. The other environment is Databricks SQL Analytics, which allows you to run SQL queries on your data lake for analysis and to generate reports and dashboards. You can control access to your dashboards so you can share them with others. In summary, you can think of the workspace as the environment in which to manage your data in a data workflow from ingress to storage in a data lake. You can think of SQL Analytics as the environment for querying that data in the data lake for post-workflow analytics and visualizations. Let's look at the workspace environment in a little more detail. In the workspace, you manage Spark clusters for all your processing. You can configure the Spark cluster details based on the memory and processing requirements that you have, and then Databricks allocates the Spark cluster in a serverless fashion, meaning the hardware under the hood is managed for you in the Azure cloud. In the workspace, you can create data workflows as jobs, which run code such as that in notebooks. Jobs can be scheduled for automation. Permissions to Databricks notebooks can be managed via access control lists, which enable notebook authors to share their notebooks and collaborate with other data experts via shared notebooks. The Databricks workspace contains many concepts and libraries. Spark SQL is a TSQL type language that lets you query data in a structured manner. Data transformations can be done easily and intuitively via Spark SQL. There is a concept of a data frame, which means a collection of data records. You can think of a data frame as a table in a traditional database. In Notebook Logic and Databricks, you can extract data frames from data sources, manipulate data frames programmatically via languages such as Scala, Python, or Spark SQL, and then load the data frames to a sync, such as a data lake. There are workspace libraries for managing streaming data as well. For example, memory streams can be created from many different possible data sources, and then transformed and written out or visualized with charts. Databricks is a layer on top of Apache Spark in the cloud, and the heart of Apache Spark is the Spark Core API. All core Spark functionality is exposed via this API. It natively supports languages such as R, Python, SQL, Scala, and Java. The SQL Analytics environment, on the other hand, exposes managed SQL endpoints for querying your data once it's been through the data workflow of the workspace environment. These endpoints scale for concurrent users and latency. Databricks integrates with many different data stores that you can query with these endpoints, such as Synapse Analytics, Cosmos DB, Azure Data Lake, and Azure Blob Storage. With SQL Analytics, you can schedule queries to run on a regular basis, and scheduled queries can have alerts and monitoring configured on them, so if a property in a result set goes out of normal, the system can notify users about it. This is a great tool to actively monitor your data. 
And SQL Analytics has rich dashboard visualization. You can manage permissions to these dashboards, which enables sharing and collaboration around data results. All the code in an Azure Databricks workspace runs on a cluster. So what exactly is a Databricks cluster? It's a configured computational resource. Under the hood, it's an Apache Spark cluster, which is a platform for running Apache Spark. Apache Spark clusters are optimized for handling big data processing in parallel for high performance. In the context of Databricks, a Databricks cluster can run one or more workloads. These workloads can be in the form of notebooks, which are coded processes, as well as jobs, which are scheduled processes that may be written as notebooks, but can also be in other forms, such as Java JAR files. Databricks clusters are designed for performant processing of big data, and as such can be configured to enable the use of graphics processing units, or GPUs, for data processing. GPU-enabled instances are naturally fast, because graphics processing units designed for processing graphics for applications such as real-time games, are by nature powerful and therefore ideal for processing big data quickly. There are two cluster types in Databricks. All-purpose clusters are not dedicated to any one process. Users can manually start, stop, and restart an all-purpose cluster. You can also call underlying REST APIs to automate the creation and management of all-purpose clusters. They're used for collaborative analysis. For example, if a data scientist is creating a notebook to collaborate with colleagues, she can spool up an all-purpose cluster and choose it as a cluster for her notebook to run on. Or she can choose an existing cluster. Several notebooks can be run on a single cluster. The only consideration is the resources needed to run the multiple notebooks. When notebooks are shut down or deleted, an all-purpose cluster is not destroyed. In other words, its life cycle is independent from the processes that are assigned to it. Then there are job clusters. A job cluster is not managed manually. Instead, it's scheduled as part of a job. Its life cycle is equivalent to the job's life cycle. In other words, when the job starts, the cluster starts. And when the job completes, the cluster terminates. Where all-purpose clusters can be restarted, hence reused, job clusters cannot be restarted. They're not usable once the job they're associated with is complete. Job clusters help guarantee dedicated resources for important scheduled jobs. In the following slides, we're going to look at cluster management. We'll discuss cluster preemption, which is when the cluster scheduler decides to preempt or avoid a cluster from running, cluster pools, which help reduce time for cluster startup and scaling, initialization scripts, which set up a cluster environment prior to running code, and a special type of cluster called the single node cluster. Databricks has a cluster scheduler that is responsible for determining jobs fair access to the cluster resources. The scheduler has the ability to preempt clusters, meaning to interrupt the cluster to allow other clusters to run. The scheduler uses preemption to try to give processes their fair share of the processing time. How it works is affected by several Spark settings, which must be set before a cluster is launched. There's a setting to enable or disable preemption altogether. Paired with this is a fair share threshold setting, which can be between zero and one. Zero disables preemption, whereas a setting of one will tell the scheduler to be aggressive when enforcing preemption for fair sharing. Effective settings are usually somewhere in between. There's also a preemption timeout. This is a number of seconds that a process has to be starved for resources before the scheduler will consider preemption to give it processor time. This, like the preemption threshold, needs to be set on a case by case basis, but it's typically between one and 100 seconds. Finally, there is an interval, which is how often the scheduler will look at the processes to consider preemption. This should logically be set to something less than the preemption timeout. In other words, the scheduler should be checking more often than resource-starved processes need the scheduler's attention. Our next topic is cluster pools. Cluster pools allow cluster-effective auto-scaling by managing a pool of ready-to-go cluster instances or nodes that can be used by any clusters associated with the pool. A cluster requires more or fewer nodes as it scales in or out to manage job load. Auto-scaling requires more cluster nodes, and spooling up new cluster nodes is time and resource consuming. So keeping a pool of nodes provides compute power 
Without the spool up cost, when a cluster has to scale, it requests new nodes from the pool that it belongs to. If it can get nodes from the pool, then it can quickly scale. However, if there are not enough nodes in the pool, it will spool up new ones which is slower. When the cluster no longer needs the nodes, it will release them back to the pool to be reused by any clusters in the pool. This shares the compute nodes across the clusters in the pool. One of the nice things about cluster pools is that each compute node only accumulates cost when it's running, not when it's idle in the pool. This means a cost will be scaled up or down along with the clusters, conserving cost. Next, we have initialization scripts. Initialization scripts run when a cluster instance is spooled up. They're meant to get the cluster into an expected state. Configuring required libraries on the cluster is a perfect example of what initialization scripts are for. There are two types. There's the global script, which is run for all clusters in the workspace. It's great for standardizing all clusters. For instance, you can guarantee that all clusters are running a common set of libraries or that they're all secured in a standard fashion. Only administrators can set up global initialization scripts, which makes sense since they affect all clusters in the workspace. Global initialization scripts are always run before the next type, which is the cluster scoped initialization script. These are scripts only relevant to one cluster. These apply to both all-purpose clusters used to run ad hoc processes and job clusters for job instances. Because the scope of these is the cluster, access control can be set up to allow only certain people to modify the script. You need to be cautious when combining global and cluster scoped initialization scripts since they can have conflicts. For example, a new cluster might have the global script run to apply certain libraries, and then its cluster scoped script might apply other libraries that conflict with the global ones, resulting in a broken cluster. Clusters typically scale their nodes when required, but there is a special cluster type called single node. Single node clusters are not meant for large processes. They're good for small, ad hoc processes that don't require a lot of processing power. Single node clusters shouldn't have multiple processes run on them because they don't offer process isolation of any kind. In other words, the processes have to share resources and there's likely to be resource conflicts. Some other limitations of single node clusters are that they're not allowed to use GPU processing for performance. They also can't be upgraded to a standard cluster. If you want a standard cluster, you'll need to spool up a completely different cluster. And where standard clusters can scale their nodes to accommodate processes, the single node cluster will only run as many parallel processing threads as there are physical cores on the cluster. In summary, single node clusters are not for heavy or collaborative work. They're not meant for production environments. Instead, they're convenient if you're doing ad hoc experimental work and want to save money and spool up time. They may also be useful for certain types of tests. As a final topic, Databricks clusters allow you to associate a Docker image with a cluster. Since container technology like Docker is popular for scalable, manageable cloud processing, this is a boon. Some best practices are to use a base build image for your Docker image that was created by Databricks to avoid any integration issues. And also, utilize initialization scripts to prepare your image when the cluster starts up. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to send Event Hub data to storage. Now, I'm in my Azure main page, and under Recent Resources, I have the two resources that we're going to need for this. First is an Event Hub's namespace, and mine's called Event Hub's BB, and the other one is a storage account, and mine's called Storage BB26. Now, I've already got mine created, but let me show you how you create these to start off. So, at the top left, I'm going to click Create a Resource. And we'll start by creating the storage account. So on the new page in the search box, type storage account and choose storage account from the drop down. And on the storage account page, click create. Now I'm on the create storage account page on the basics tab. And under project details, I need to choose a subscription. It's already chosen it for me. And I need to choose a resource group or create a new one. So I'm just going to choose the one I already have. Under instance details, you need to put in a storage account name, which is unique. So this could just be storage 5454, something that makes it unique. Choose your location. 
and then click Review and Create at the bottom left. Then at the top of the Create Storage Account page, it says Validation Passed, and you can click Create at the bottom left. So that's how you create the storage account. I'm going to click Home at the top left, go back to my home page, and now I'll show you how to create the Event Hub namespace. Click Create a Resource at the top left, and on the New page in the search box, type in Event Hub. Then from the drop down list, choose Event Hubs. And on the Event Hubs page, click Create. Now I'm on the Create Namespace page on the Basics tab. Under Project Details, you need a subscription. Mine's already chosen. And under Resource Group, you create a new one or you choose one. So I'll choose the one I already have. Under Instance Details, you need to give it a namespace name, which has to be unique. Choose your location. And then at the bottom left, click Review and Create. Oh, I must have missed something. I'll go back to Basics. And I didn't choose a pricing tier. So I've clicked back to the Basics tab. And under Instance Details, you need to choose a pricing tier. For this, you can choose the Standard. You can't use the Basic because Basic won't let us do what we're about to do. And at the bottom left, click Review and Create. And now it says Validation Succeeded at the top. So at the bottom left, you can click Create and create your namespace. Now I'm going to click Home at the top left. So I'm going to take you to my storage account. So under Recent Resources on my home page, I'll click Storage Account. On the overview of my storage account, I'm going to scroll down on the right and click Containers. And you can see that under Containers, I have one container called Event Hub Dash Data. If you don't have a container and you're following along, just click the New Container button at the top left of the screen and create the container. So now I'm going to click Home again at the top left. Under Recent Resources on my home page, I'm going to go to my Event Hubs namespace, which is called Event Hubs BB. And on the left hand menu, if I scroll down under Entities, I'm going to click Event Hubs. Then on the right hand side, I have an empty list of Event Hubs for my namespace. At the top left, I'm going to click the Plus Event Hub button. And now I'm on the Create Event Hub page. It's asking me for a name. So I'm just going to call this Event Hub Demo Hub. And down below it says Capture. You want to set that to On. This is going to capture what's coming into the Event Hub. And it's going to write it to your storage. So if I scroll down, there's a pull down menu called Capture Provider. I want it to say Azure Storage Account. And then there's Azure Storage Container. I'm going to click the Select Container button to the right of that. And it gives me a list of storage accounts. I'm going to choose my Storage BB26. And it shows me the containers in that storage account on the right hand side. And I'll choose my container Event Hub Dash Data and click Select at the bottom left of that plate. So now I've chosen the container to write the data into. Now, if I scroll down, there's also a Sample capture file name formats. And you could change this if you wanted to, but I'm just going to leave it as a default. But it starts with the namespace, and then it's the event hub name, and then the partition ID, because event hubs have more than one partition, and then the year, month, day, hour, minute, and second. So it creates a folder path for each file that it writes. So it shows below that an example. It's going to look something like event hubs bb slash demo hub slash zero, which is a partition, slash 2021 slash 04 slash 19 slash 22, etc., etc., right down to the second. So I'm going to click create at the bottom. So now I'm back to my event hubs namespace screen, and on the right hand side, I have on my list of event hubs demo hub. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to storage. So I'm going to click home at the top left. Under my recent resources, I'll click my storage account, storage BB26. On the overview on the right, I'll scroll down and I'll click containers. Then under containers, I'm going to click event hub dash data. I'll be refreshing this because this is where our data should appear when it comes from the event hub. So now what we need to do is write data to the event hub. So I'm going to open up Visual Studio and I have a project here that's very simple that writes some events to the event hub. In the code on the left hand side here, you'll see that on line 13, it's looking for a string that's called event hub name. 
On line 14, there's a string that's called connection string. So these are the details of our event hub that we need to fill in. So event hub name was called demo hub. So I'm just going to fill that in on line 13. And the connection string is the connection string of your event hub namespace. So if I go back to Azure for a moment and I click home at the top left and under my recent resources, I'll click on my event hubs namespace. Then on the menu on the left, under settings, I'm going to click shared access policies. And on the right hand side, it has one policy by default called root manage shared access key. I'm going to click on that and a blade comes out on the right hand side that says SAS policy root manager shared access key. And it has a list of keys and connection strings. So there's one called connection string primary key. I'm going to copy that by clicking the little copy to clipboard icon to the right. Now I'm going to go back to Visual Studio and on line 14, I will paste that connection string as the string called connection string. So briefly here, what this code does on line 16, it creates what's called an event hub producer client using that event hub name and connection string, which gives us access to the event hub. On line 18, we have a while true, which is just an endless loop. On line 21 and 22, we set up an event. On line 24, we call producer.sendAsync and we give it a list of events and uh, we just give it the one event. And we should actually be doing a dot wait here. So I'm going to fill that in as well. I've just noticed since it's an async call. Line 26 is a thread dot sleep and awaits 200 milliseconds. So what we're doing is we're just endlessly sending some events that just say this is an event body every 200 milliseconds. So I'm going to hit F5 and run this. So that is now running. So I'm going to go back to Azure. And in Azure, I'm going to click home at the top left. Under my recent resources, I'm going to click my storage account. And on the right, on the overview of my storage account, I'm going to scroll down and hit containers. And in the container list, I'll click event hub dash data. And now you see that there's a folder and it's the name of my event hub namespace, event hubs BB. So I'm just going to click that folder. And under that is a demo hub. I'm going to click that. And under that is zero. That is the partition number. I'll click that. And then 2021 is the year. I'll click that. And it's four is the month. I'll click that. And then we have the day 19th. Click that. And the hour is 22, 31. And we keep going down and we eventually get an Avro file. Now, a lot of Azure tools such as Data Factory, etc., can read Avro files. So if you can get your data from Event Hub into Avro files like this, then you can feed these Avro files into a data pipeline and you can do more with it. So I'm going to click on this Avro file and it opens it up in a blade on the right hand side. And I'm going to click the edit tab forth from the left. And if we take a look at the contents, it's in a Avro format, so it's difficult to read, but on line three, we see the words, this is an event body. So we have an Avro file, which is storing these events. So we've successfully fed the event hub data to the storage. So in conclusion, you can use this technique to capture data at the event hub and write it to a storage account so that you can use it for data pipelines downstream. In this video, we're going to look at Azure Databricks notebooks, which are documents not just for running code, but also creating presentations, which can include text as well as visuals and are key to professional collaboration using Databricks. To get started, let's break down what goes into a notebook from a code perspective. First off, a notebook is not just one code source. A notebook can contain multiple code cells. In fact, although an individual cell is limited to a maximum of 16 megabytes of code and output, there's no logical limit to the number of code cells in a notebook. Notebook code cells support many languages, such as Scala, Python, R, and SQL. The code in one cell 
is limited to a single language, but different cells in a notebook can use different languages. This is one of the strengths of Databricks notebooks for collaboration. You can include many different elements in different languages in one cohesive notebook. There are many libraries for connecting to external resources, which gives you a flexible environment for data flows that extract data from one source and load it into another. And notebooks are also versioned, so you can always roll back your notebook by going back in the version history. As mentioned, Databricks notebooks offer advanced visuals as well as code. The standard data component in a notebook is the data frame, which is a memory representation of a database table structure. With the display function, you can easily show a data frame represented as a table. There are also options to change the output from a table to one of many plot types, such as bar graphs, line graphs, pie charts, etc. On top of the standard plot types are more complex visualizations for machine learning for aspects such as residual plots and decision trees. And there's functionality to make colors consistent for a chart's visual presentation. Series set consistency will ensure that the same item will be represented by the same color in different series on the chart, as long as the value sets of the series are the same. If you have different value sets in series, but still want to maintain color consistency for values, then you would set global color consistency for the plot. One big strength of notebooks is the ability to share them. You can do this by publishing them to dashboards. Dashboards are displays that can be created directly from a notebook and then customized. You can generate several different dashboards from a single notebook if presenting certain data from the notebook separately makes sense. And by sharing the link, you can share the dashboard with others. Dashboards are not real-time displays, but you can update them on a schedule, which means the data does not get too stale. And like notebooks, Dashboards can be versioned, so you always have historical versions of the dashboard to fall back on if need be. Here are some of the reasons why data professionals love using notebooks. They're quick to code. The interface is simple, and you can write the code directly into the interface without any complicated integration. Notebooks and the dashboards derived from them are excellent for collaboration, which is a big part of data analysis. Notebooks put the focus on data. Everything in a notebook can derive from data, either read from a source or embedded in the notebook. Notebooks serve as a natural way to document data results. You can easily scale when needed using a scalable cluster, so there's a natural, easy progression from small-scale proof-of-concept to larger-scale production datasets. And because it's all online, you have global access to your notebooks, dashboards, and data, as does anybody you want to share them with. So in summary, notebooks are more than simply a place to run your code. They're also a platform for presentation and collaboration with others. They focus on data, and since Databricks brings notebooks to the cloud, they can literally be accessed from anywhere in the world. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to manage and run an Azure Databricks notebook. I'm also going to show you some of the advanced features of notebooks, such as comments and versioning. So I'm on my home page of Azure, and under Recent Resources, if you follow along, you're going to have to create an Azure Databricks service. I've already created one, but I'll show you how to set one up real quick. So if I go to Create a Resource at the top left, on the New page, I'm going to type in, in the search box, Azure Databricks. And from the drop-down, I'll choose Azure Databricks. And on the Azure Databricks screen, I'll click Create. That takes me to the Create an Azure Databricks Workspace page, and I'm on the Basics tab. So you'll need to choose a subscription, and then choose a resource group or create a new resource group. Under Instance Details, you'll have to create a workspace name, and it has to be unique. So it might be Databricks 3344, for instance. Choose a region, and you can leave the pricing tier as standard. And then at the bottom left, click Review and Create. And if you get a validation succeeded at the top of the screen in the green bar, then click Create at the bottom left. So that's how you create your Azure Databricks instance. So I'm going to click Home at the top left. That takes me back to my home page. And under Recent Resources, I'm going to click my Databricks instance. So that takes me to the Overview page of my Azure Databricks service. So on the right-hand side on Overview, I'm going to scroll down and click Launch Workspace. So now I'm signed into my workspace. So what I'm going to do is create a new notebook. 
Now, before I do that, I just want to mention I have a cluster running here. So if I go to the left menu and sixth button from the top, I'll click clusters. And in the cluster table on the right hand side, you'll see I have a one called demo dash cluster. Now I created just a single node cluster. So let me show you how you create that. I'll click the create cluster button at the top above the table. And on the new cluster window, I'm just going to type in a cluster name so you can give it any name. And for cluster mode, just choose single node and leave everything else default. And at the top, click create cluster. So that's how you create the cluster and clusters take several minutes to spool up. If I click on clusters again in the left menu and on the right, I see the cluster table. You'll know your cluster is ready to go when the state is running and to the left of the name is a green circle. Okay, so in the left menu, third from the top, I'm gonna to click workspace and I get a blade pop up to the right that's called workspace. And there's a section called users. I'm going to expand that. And under users, I see myself. So I'm gonna click on myself. And you'll see that under myself, I have trash. Now we'll look at trash later when we delete our notebook. But if I go back to users to the left, I'm going to click the little carrot beside my name. And I get a pull down options and I will choose create at the top and I will click notebook, which is the first option. So now I get a create notebook window. I need to give it a name. So I'm just going to call it demo dash notebook. Default language is Python. I'm just going to leave it as default. You could choose a different language, but I'll just leave it as Python. And for cluster, it has my demo cluster by default chosen. So on the bottom right of this window, I'll click create. And so it creates my notebook. At the top left, it says demo dash notebook. In brackets, it says Python, so I know what language it is. If I click on Python, I can change the default language. I get a pop-up window that says change default language, and I can choose it. But as you'll see, we can actually choose the language in the notebook itself in every command box. So the first thing I'm going to show you is actually overriding the Python language and instead using Markdown. If you're not familiar with Markdown, it's a way to format text and it's really good for visuals and presentations. So my notebook starts off by default with a command box called CMD1 at the top left and it's a gray command box and I'm going to paste some code in here and this is Markdown. So on line one, percent MD, which means this is Markdown. So that will override Python. If I didn't put a percentage line like that, then it would run this as if it were Python. But instead, I'm telling it it's Markdown. Line two, I give it a header. Headers are done with hashtags to the left. So two hashtags means this is a level two header. Line three is just three dashes and that will leave a solid horizontal line. And line five through 10 is a format of a table in Markdown. So I have a table with two columns. One is first name and one is last name. So if I click away from this command box, you will actually see the results of the Markdown. So you can see that I have a header, it says people table, nice line, and then a formatted table. So that's a really easy way to make nice formatted text and displays. Now I'll leave that command block and I can create another one. If I go to the bottom of this command block and there's a little plus circle that appears. And if I hover over it, it says insert a new cell. So I can click that and I get a new command cell or command block. Now in this one, I'm going to paste some actual Python. So I won't have to override the language. So on line one, I have import pandas as PA. That's just a special library that simplifies my code. In this case, line three, I created data frame and I actually loaded in from a CSV and it's a free demo CSV that you can use for testing that's online. So the PA, which is my pandas instance, I say dot read underscore CSV. And in round brackets and in single quotes, I give it the URL to the CSV and it's called homes.csv. Line four, I display that data frame. Line five, I plot that data frame. So I wanna show you that we can look at the data in two different ways with two different outputs. One is going to be a table from line four. Line five is going to create a plot and line six is displaying the plot. So we can run this by clicking shift enter. 
And as you can see in the results, there's actually two results. There is a table which shows all the data from that CSV. And then if I scroll down, it actually created the plot. So if you're collaborating on a notebook, you can actually place information in here and you can comment on the notebook. Let me show you how that works. So at the top right of the screen, there are some buttons. The third from the left looks like a little comment bubble. And if I hover over it, it says view and add comments to this notebook. So I'm going to click that. And below the button in yellow, it says select some code from the notebook to start commenting. So let's say I had a comment on my command section two, line three, which is actually reading the CSV. So I'm going to highlight that. And then you notice beside command two to the right, there appears a little comment bubble. And if I click that, now I can add a comment. I get a pop up box that has my name at the top and it has a text box that I can enter a comment. So I might ask whoever's created, let's say somebody else has created this notebook, I might ask, where can I find more information like this? Question mark. And I'll click comment at the bottom left. And now that comment is associated with that line. So you can collaborate and add comments on these as you go, and it'll show the comments from different people. Another nice thing about notebooks is that they're versioned. So again, at the top right, the rightmost button, two buttons to the right from the comment button, if I hover over that, it says view revision history for this notebook. If I click on that, then on the right-hand side of the screen, I get all of the revisions of this notebook. So for instance, there's been one, two, three, four, five revisions, including the one we're looking at right now, which is at the top. If I go right back to the first one, it tells me what the date and the time were. And if I click on it, I get an option to restore this revision. And it shows me on the left what it looked like. And you can see that it was just a empty command cell. So I don't actually want to go back to that. But the point being is I can restore to any revision I want. So the last thing I'm going to show you here is how you get rid of a notebook. So on the left menu, Third button from the top, I'm going to click Workspace. And the Workspace blade pops out to the right. And I can see my users, which is just me. And that's expanded to show my demo notebook and trash. So if I click the little arrow beside Demo Notebook, I can choose Move to Trash. And I get a pop-up that says, are you sure you want to move Demo Notebook to the trash? I'm going to click Confirm and Move to Trash. Now my notebook is still there and it will be deleted after so many days, but it's in the trash. So if I go back to my workspace blade and trash is still open, if I click the arrow beside trash, I can choose empty trash. And it says, are you sure you want to permanently delete all items in the trash? And it tells you that they'll automatically be deleted after 30 days. At the bottom right, I'm going to click confirm and delete. So in conclusion, Azure Databricks notebooks are a flexible way to generate content and also collaborate with others. In this video, I'm going to examine Azure Databricks jobs. Jobs are different from standalone notebooks in Databricks in that they're meant to be non-interactive, where you might spool up a regular notebook to manually run some queries to share the results with colleagues. A job is a form of automation meant to run in the background. A data pipeline is a good use case for a job. Jobs are typically scheduled to run, they can be run ad hoc via a manual intervention of someone clicking a button, although that's not their main use case. A job is really some executable task that's scheduled to run with particular parameters. So for example, a notebook can be turned into a job simply by creating a job, which is a schedule, and assigning the notebook as its task to run. So if you're already comfortable coding notebooks, you don't have to learn any new programming skills to create jobs. You can use the same programming platform. Every time a job runs, it creates an artifact in Databricks called a job run, which can be identified by a unique ID. There's a display to visualize job run history for up to 60 days for troubleshooting purposes. If you dig into the job run, it contains details, such as links to logs for further detailed troubleshooting. And you can export the results of the job run history, and in this way maintain job run history for longer than the standard 60 days if required.
Jobs can run on three different types of clusters. You can configure your job to use a new job cluster. A new job cluster offers an isolated environment for your job, so it's ideal for jobs that are important enough that they shouldn't be affected by other processes. The cluster starts and ends with your job. Once your job is done, the cluster ends and the next time the job runs, if it has a recurring schedule, it will spool up another new job cluster. You can also configure your job to use a terminated cluster that's been stopped. You would do this to reuse the cluster for job runs. This only works if your job has restart permission for the terminated cluster. And finally, you can run your job on an all-purpose cluster. This should be used for simpler, less essential tasks because an all-purpose cluster is not isolated like a new job cluster. Other jobs, and even ad hoc notebooks, can run on all-purpose clusters. An ideal use for all-purpose clusters is scheduling a job to update data on a dashboard because it's not resource heavy and not a critical failure if the update fails. So let's discuss job configuration. Jobs can be configured with alerts. You can give a list of email addresses to send alert messages to on the events of the job starting, the job succeeding, and the job failing. You can optionally be alerted about jobs skipped by the job scheduler as well. And you can also configure the maximum allowed concurrent or parallel runs of the job. This is useful if you want to schedule job runs to overlap or if you have a reason to run parallel runs with different inputs. Any runs that exceed the maximum parallel runs will be skipped. We've talked a lot about jobs. What about configuring the tasks that the job runs? Your tasks will likely need certain libraries. These can be attached to the job. Within the task code, you can use the following parameters, which will be filled in at runtime. Job ID, or the unique identifier of the job. Run ID, or the unique identifier for the job run. Start date, which is the date the run started. Start time, or the time the run started. And finally, the task retry count. This tells you how many times a job run has been retried. The first run will be zero, and it will increase on every retry run. You can also set the time out on the job or how long the task will be allowed to run before the run is aborted. And you can set the number of retries. If a job reaches its time out, it will retry this number of times before giving up. There are some job limitations that you should be aware of. You can run a maximum of 5,000 jobs per workspace per hour. You can run a maximum of 1,000 jobs concurrently or in parallel per workspace at any given time. Databricks has a minimum of 10 seconds between job runs triggered subsequently by a schedule, even if the schedule is set to a smaller time span. A job's output can never be larger than 20 megabytes, and a single cell within the notebook of a running job can never output more than 8 megabytes. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate the use of jobs in Azure Databricks. Jobs allow tasks such as notebooks to be run on a schedule with no interaction. And this is useful for things like data pipelines, which run regularly. So I'm on my home page in Azure, and I have an Azure Databricks service instance set up under my recent resources, so I'm going to click on that. And now in the overview of my Databricks service, on the right, I'm going to scroll down and click Launch Workspace. Okay, so now here I am in the workspace. And I've already set up a notebook, so I'm going to show that to you. So on the third button down on the left, I'm going to click Workspace. And under Workspace, I'll click Users. Under Users, I'll click My User. And under My User, I have Demo-Notebook. And I'm going to click on that. Now the screen is showing my notebook. And in the command cell, I have six lines, and they're all print lines. So this is very simple. Basically, I've set this up so that we can see some parameters that are sent in from the job. So on line one, I say demo parameter. That's the name of the, one of the parameters I'm going to send in. Line two is printing dbutils.widgets.get demo parameter. So that actually reads the parameter value. Line three is just a carriage return. Line four prints job run start date. Line five, again, uses dbutils.widgets.get and it gets a, what's called a start date. And then line six is just another carriage return. So what we're going to do is set up a job, and the job is going to run this notebook on a regular basis. So in the menu on the left, third from the bottom, I'm going to click Jobs. 
And now on the right, I get a table, which is my jobs table. And right now it's empty. But at the top left, I'm going to click the button that says Create Job. Now I'm on the Job Create window, and I'm on the tab Configuration. And under that is Schedule Type. Now there's two schedule types. Manual is a paused job that you can run manually by clicking a button. Scheduled means that the job is active and it's going to be running on a schedule. Now we want to run it on a schedule, so I'm going to click Scheduled. Now under that, we have a section called Schedule. There are some pull-down menus here that allow you to choose a certain schedule. And under that is a checkbox that says Show Cron Syntax. I'm not going to explain Cron here, other than to say that it's a way to describe schedules. If I click on it, you can see an example Cron string just above it in the text box. So I'm going to uncheck Cron again and use the wizard instead. So right now, by default, it says every day at 18.52, so that's 6.52 p.m. UTC. You'll notice if you pull down the drop-down where it says UTC, you can choose different time zones. I'm going to leave it as is, and instead of every day, I'm going to pull down the drop-down on day, and I'm going to choose minute. So my schedule is every minute. Now underneath schedule, we have a section called task. And the first part under task is type. And there's different things you can run as tasks. You can run notebook. If I pull down the drop-down for type, You'll see Notebook, Jar, Spark Submit, and Python. We're just going to leave it at Notebook. And beside that, it says Select Notebook. I'll click the little folder to the right of that. And I get a Select Notebook window pop up. On the left, I'm going to choose Users. And in the middle, I'm going to choose my user, which is Build.Brooks. And on the right, I'm going to choose Demo-Notebook. Then at the bottom right, I'll click Confirm. So it's going to run my demo-notebook. So now we have to set up the cluster. Under type is cluster. We could allow it to create a new cluster, but instead I have a cluster running. So if I open the dropdown, I see existing all-purpose clusters and I'm, I have a cluster there called demo cluster, so I'll choose that. Under cluster is parameters, and under parameters is a link that says add. So I'm going to click that. And I get a key box on the left and a value box on the right. So you can do key value pairs here. The parameters that we had in the notebook were demo parameter, and capitalization is important here. So it's D-E-M-O capital P-A-R-A-M-E-T-E-R. -E -E I just chose to call it that. This parameter could be called anything, as long as it matches with what's in my notebook. And I'm going to type in here, this is my demo parameter value. That is the value I'm going to give it, so we should see that when it runs. Now I'm going to click Add again under parameters. And remember, we also had a start date. So I'm going to create a parameter called start date with a capital D. And the value will be a token that is filled in by Databricks. Databricks has some tokens that you can use that will get filled in here. And one of them is curly bracket, curly bracket, start underscore date. All of these tokens start and end with two curly brackets. And you can look up in the Databricks documentation what they are. But start underscore date is one of them. So it will actually get the start date of when the job is running. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. So I'll go back to the top and I'll click create. Oh, and it says job must have a name, of course. So I'll call it demo-job and I'll click create. So successfully created job, it says in the right in green. So since it's scheduled, it should just automatically run. Now notice I have two tabs, configuration and runs. So I'm going to click runs. And now I'm on the runs page and it has active runs and it has completed runs. And there are refresh buttons on the right-hand side. So for under active runs, I'll click refresh. And I'll have to wait a few seconds for it to run. There it goes. So now I have a record in the table under active runs. And it's running right now. If I click, yep, there we go. I didn't even have to click refresh. Under that, under completed runs, it's now complete. So now there's a record in that table. On the far left, I can click view details under run. And now I'm on the details page for that particular run. And if I scroll down, I see output and it shows my code and it also shows the output. So here's the output of those prints. Demo parameter colon, this is my demo parameter value. So it got that value from the job. And job run start date is 2021-0421. That's today. That's April 21st, 2021. So in conclusion, a job allows you to run your notebook as a scheduled task. And you can also send parameters to your notebook to affect the outcome.
In this video, we're going to look at a specific issue with Databricks jobs and local storage. Jobs usually have to scale to handle changing data conditions. Think of a data pipeline. A typical data pipeline might have to handle much more data flow at certain times than at others. As time goes on, the data flow may permanently increase as well. Jobs use local cluster storage to perform tasks such as data transformations. But a cluster's local storage is set at creation. So how can you predict the local storage that a job will require when the job's local storage needs naturally need to scale? Setting maximum local storage to take future scaling into consideration is wasteful. The answer is local storage autoscaling. Autoscaling is enabled automatically when you create a cluster. This feature monitors the disk space that's being used by the virtual machines that are running your job. If a virtual machine in the cluster is running out of disk space, Databricks automatically adds another managed disk to that virtual machine. There's a limit per virtual machine of 5 terabytes of disk space, additional to the local storage internal to the virtual machine itself. After this limit, the virtual machine can't scale disk space any further. Now that we've discussed scaling out of disk space, what about scaling in, or detaching managed disks so that they're no longer required? For instance, say your data flow decreases and your job requires less disk space. It's worth noting that managed disks cost money to run, so there's incentive in minimizing wasted managed disk space. The way that it works is that disks are detached only when the cluster stops running. As long as your cluster is running, even if the disk space is not being used, it will still be dedicated. There are a few ways you can limit managed disk usage. You can configure your clusters to use GPU, and you can also enable automatic termination on your clusters. So how does enabling GPU on a cluster improve managed disk use? Well, first, a quick description of GPU cluster instances. They're designed for high-performance jobs. As GPU processors are high-performing processors, ideal for number crunching. The first virtual machine instance of any cluster stays running for the length of the job. So managed disks on this instance will be in use for the length of the job. GPU instances will be more efficient in this case simply because they'll complete the job faster, detaching the managed disk faster when the job completes. This is the benefit of GPU instances for managed disks. Additionally, you can also enable spot instances for your cluster. With spot instances, any additional virtual machine instances that are spawned will be deallocated as long as they're no longer needed. This combination of on demand and spot instances will deallocate managed disks quicker than without spot instances, where all instances stay allocated until the end of the job. Spot instances scale in and out as needed, and therefore, so do their managed disk instances. Finally, you can save managed disk usage by setting automatic termination on your cluster. The drive here is that idle clusters cost money, so you don't want to keep them around longer than you have to. Without automatic termination, it's possible to spawn a cluster and then leave it running indefinitely. With auto termination set, your cluster terminates after a set number of minutes of inactivity on the cluster. This naturally limits managed disk inactivity, since any managed disks are detached when the cluster is terminated. The default cluster auto termination time is 120 minutes or two hours, although that's configurable. By default, high concurrency clusters or clusters that are designed to run several tasks in parallel are set to not automatically terminate. This is because such clusters are often used for continual jobs, such as streaming pipelines. Automatic termination is useful in scenarios such as a data scientist starting a cluster to perform some experimental analysis and forgetting to terminate the cluster afterward, or several data scientists using the same cluster for their notebooks where nobody is directly responsible for terminating the cluster appropriately. Azure Databricks can be used for more than just processing static data from a database. It's also capable of managing streaming data at production quality. It does this through the Apache Spark Structured Streaming API. The Structured Streaming API is a robust stream processing solution. In this video, we're going to deep dive into how structured streaming works in Azure Databricks. Production quality streaming needs to be fault tolerant. The structured streaming API supports this with the checkpoint location option in a query. This option accepts a file path to store query state information. 
Then, if the query is run and fails, the query's previous state can be read from the file path, and the query can rerun where it left off. So this enables stateful retries of queries, which ensures consistency and fault tolerance. There are some specific job configurations to use when using stateful queries with retry. A query is triggered to retry at its previous state when the job fails. The job relies on a new cluster each retry, so set your job to always use a new cluster. Set your job to retry on failure, otherwise your query will not be able to continue on failure. This functionality works with Spark 2.1 or higher, so make sure you're using an appropriate Spark version. And operations should be aware when jobs are failing. So you should consider configuring alerts and notifications so the appropriate people are emailed on job failure. Don't set a schedule on your job. Once streaming jobs are started, they run indefinitely and don't need to be scheduled. Your job should have no timeout, since this will interrupt your stream query. You should set the job to have only one maximum concurrent run. Streaming data for a single run needs to run sequentially and set unlimited retries. This allows the query to be recovered even if several retries are required. This might happen, for example, if there's a transient failure, such as a temporary network issue. There are a few details that need to be maintained between query failures or checkpoints. In order for a query to continue where it left off after a failure, the number of sources or the type of the source for the stream shouldn't change. In other words, the from part of your stream query needs to be querying data from the same stream source or sources. Likewise, the output or sync cannot change. When the queries rerun, it must be outputting to the same type of sync and the same number of syncs. And finally, certain stateful operations in the query can't change between retries. Some examples are group by details and aggregate details. All of these details are part of the state that's stored to file before the query is retried. So that data is expected to stay consistent between retries in order for the query to be idempotent, meaning given the same inputs, the query always returns the same output. Next in our conversation of structured streams is watermarks. A watermark manages late arriving and out of order data in the stream. Stateful or aggregate operations on the stream are affected by late arriving data, which may be out of order. That is, data with an older timestamp that arrives in the stream at a later date. This can happen often in streaming. For instance, if data is being read from real-world devices, the device being disrupted for a short time may result in no data events for several seconds, followed by a stream of late events sent when the device catches up. Now let's say you were calculating an average value every minute for that stream, and the device sent data delayed by 30 seconds. Some of that data should have been in your minute average, but wasn't due to it arriving late. However, your minute average calculations can't wait around forever for old data to arrive, or they would never be calculated. A watermark defines how long your aggregate should wait around for late data. If late data comes in within the watermark time delay, your aggregates will recalculate. Otherwise, the late data will be ignored by the aggregate. The aggregate value will not be output to the result stream until the wait time is complete, meaning a watermark introduces a delay between the input and output of the stream. In other words, if your minute average calculation has a watermark telling it to accept data as late as 2 minutes, then the average will be written to the output only after 2 minutes has elapsed. You add a watermark to a query with the operation's watermark, which accepts a unique name for the watermark, and the time delay, such as 1 hour. Watermarks can be combined in a query. For example, you might want to combine two input streams. Perhaps you want to join values from two streams on timestamp. In the first stream, data can be delayed by up to an hour. And in the second stream, which runs slower, data can be delayed up to two hours. You can create a join in your query, specifying a watermark of one hour for the first stream and two hours for the second. By default, the join will wait for the slowest stream so joined output events in the stream will be delayed by two hours. This is the safest watermark delay strategy, because waiting for the slowest stream means stream events are not likely to be dropped. But if you want faster processing, you can set the system to track by the fastest stream, or the stream that only accepts data late by one hour. This means the overall latency will be one hour instead of two, but data in the slower stream is likely to be dropped more aggressively. 
So in this course, we've examined the features of Azure Databricks, clusters, notebooks, and jobs. We did this by exploring Azure Databricks and Databricks cluster features, capturing stream data using Azure Event Hub, working with Azure Databricks notebooks and Azure Databricks jobs, and auto-scaling with Azure Databricks and structured streaming. In our next course, we'll move on to describe Azure Databricks processing types and features.